Hello, my name is Paul Marchbanks, and this is Digging in the Dirt, with a few spoiler-free musings about Christopher Nolan's film Oppenheimer by way of Roman history, William Wordsworth's poetry, and my own experience with nuclear reactors. That old myth about Nero fiddling while Rome burns has proven rather persistent despite its inaccuracy. Placing a fiddle in the first century AD is a blatant anachronism. The earliest versions of the instrument didn't exist until the 10th century. Historians also note that Nero was more than 30 miles away from Rome when a southern slum caught fire and spread to most of the city's 14 districts. Perhaps the myth endures because we love a despicable villain, and the emperor, despite his elimination of capital punishment, his patronage of the arts, and the empowerment of abused slaves during the first part of his reign, also would blame Rome's deadly fire on Christians as a pretext for oppressing them in the next part of his reign. Not cool. It's far easier to demonize the perpetrators of evil like this than to treat them as complex, conflicted individuals. We're not big on nuance these days. I believe there's another likely reason the Nero myth persists. It's not just psychotic tyrants who like to watch things burn. I imagine few of us completely lose the attraction to fire we developed when first-handed matches as kids. The slow crawl of an inchworm-wide gleam of light along a stick before it fully catches the twirling flames that dance along the edge of wood in a bonfire, the whirl of embers that explode from a cracked log like a cloud of fireflies lighting up the night, these bright coruscations etched against thick darkness, mesmerize campers of all ages. Most of us appreciate the aesthetics of high contrast. We also, oddly enough, find enjoyment in the combustion of things designed to serve another function, like houses and barns. Though the loss of such structures might bring destitution, such visual spectacle can appear poetic to the outside observer, as if it provides some artistic commentary on the ephemerality of all material things. Filmmakers recognize this rhetorical power and frequently incorporate such scenes to sharpen a film's poignancy, underscoring the self-destructive nature of obsession deepening nostalgia for one's lost youth, and adding stark symbolism to a family's decision to leave home and remake themselves. Other times, of course, the fascination with conflagration simply indicates our penchant for wanton destruction. Until computer-generated effects so filled the movie screen that they began to lose their impact, the inclusion of genuine, elaborately choreographed explosions that endangered our characters and sometimes our actors guaranteed a nail-biting audience. The more near-death incidents in cinema of the 80s and 90s, the better. Watching a hero elude consuming flames sharpened appreciation of our own comparatively boring and safe lives. It can also be eminently satisfying to observe vindictively, those pyrotechnics that eliminate the enemy in real life as in fiction. Television watchers the world over sat mesmerized by the spectacle of Patriot missiles striking their Iraqi targets in the early 90s. Palestinians cheered as fire engulfed New York's Twin Towers a decade later, and more recently, both Ukrainian and Russian newscasters have transfixed home audiences by incorporating videos of death-dealing explosions. Though Star Wars fans didn't appreciate every change George Lucas made to A New Hope back in 1997, most of us appreciated the spectacular, if unrealistic, Praxis effect shockwaves added to the explosion of Alderaan and the destruction of the Death Star the fiery erasure of tens of thousands of people, underscores the unregenerate evil of a film's villains, grants our heroes an enviable moral clarity moving forward, and, one has to admit, looks pretty awesome. There's at least one other reason we enjoy watching objects burn, I think, and it concerns our curiosity about the structure of things. Watching something fall apart can be educational, can 
reveal much about its strengths and weak points. A burning log reveals the latticework of fibers of which it is composed, and the building of fire slowly unveils the wooden skeleton within its walls. The sledgehammer, wrecking ball, and controlled demolition don't offer this kind of slow, artistic reveal. Such revelation comes at great cost, of course, as William Wordsworth once noted in the poem The Tables Turned, our drive to understand often involves destroying the very thing we wish to comprehend. Quote, our meddling intellect misshapes the beauteous forms of things. We murder to dissect. Wordsworth has in mind sciences like biology, but also, surprisingly, the fine arts themselves. Instead of approaching nature through either the microscope's lens or the artist's contemplative eye, sometimes, he argues, we should just wander and wonder without grasping for insight. The British poet encourages his readers to put away their books, including the one holding his poem, and take a turn in the great outdoors. Nature's beauty unlocks something intrinsically good within us, Wordsworth believes, whenever we manage to suspend our analytical powers and just drink in the trees, flowers, birdsong, and cloudy skies freely on offer. Now that, as of a couple weeks ago, I have finally visited the Lake District that inspired Wordsworth's reflections, I totally get it. Having wandered the rolling hills of Grasmere, crisscrossed repeatedly by Wordsworth and fellow poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, I more fully understand their shared awe in the face of what they both believe to be a designed, created natural order. Soon after arriving at the cottage we rented outside town, I tripped down a nearby secluded path bordered by moss-quilted stone fences and a gurgling brook, a canopied trail that filtered light through abundant leaves and concluded in a dramatic waterfall plunging down the face of a wind-weathered rock. I felt like I had wandered into fairyland. This is the face we sometimes allow nature to present, a beauty unaltered by modern technology, which, according to Wordsworth, has much to teach us when we let it. In the poem Lines Written a Few Miles Above Tintern Abbey, Wordsworth claims that nature offers sensations sweet, which inspire our little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. It also can magnify our appreciation for the design of things, quote, with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy. Christopher Nolan begins the film Oppenheimer with a memorable reminder of nature's ability to instruct those who pay attention, opening with a shot of scattered raindrops striking a watery surface. Each tiny little percussion generates a predictable circular ripple which rolls outwards, disrupting a surface area far larger than that of the impact site. It's a gentle and subtle visual prelude that signals one of the film's key tenets. Small-scale events can have wide-ranging consequences. This motif works itself out in the multiple romantic liaisons that Robert Oppenheimer forms, the working relationships he fosters, the political connections foisted on him by circumstance, and, most famously, in the team of scientists he oversees whose collective efforts will alter the lives of everyone on the face of the planet. When these scientists look closely at what Wordsworth called the beauteous forms of things, they find intricate connections among invisible particles that can be disrupted to devastating effect. Instead of murdering in order to dissect, a procedure familiar to any high school student with scalpel in one hand and frog in the other, an act of dissection on the subatomic level can create the potential for murder on an inconceivable scale. In the pre-industrial past, one knew that a single spark could devastate hundreds of acres of woodland in hours. In the late 1930s and early 40s, a few scientists faced an impossible quandary. They could create a weapon no one could ever be trusted to use responsibly because any use of it in a populated area would it ensure the instantaneous death of countless innocent victims or instead hamstring their own efforts to develop this weapon of mass destruction and allow other potentially hostile nations 
to develop it first. I found myself in a much lower stakes but equally fraught situation while watching Oppenheimer. Christopher Nolan obviously intends his viewers to be divided as they watch this complex film. Right answers are in short supply. Matters were even more complicated for me, given my family's history with nuclear reactors. Nolan's characters kept name-dropping recognizable places and terms. The Los Alamos site, where they assembled our first atom bombs and test detonated a small nuclear device? Check. The location of my father's first job out of college. The Hanford reactor in Richland, Washington, which produced the plutonium used in the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki. Check the location of my father's second job, my hometown through age 11, and the impetus for much of the static and kinetic art created by Eric Lopresti, a professional painter and childhood friend of mine from the Richland area who continues to this day to work through the reactor's complex legacy. The X-10 graphic reactor which enriched the uranium used to create Little Boy, detonated over Hiroshima. Check the site of my father's third job, and the home of ACAC, the Atomic City Aquatic Club, which provided my hometown's swim team with its greatest nemesis. My dad's periods of employment did, did not overlap with the creation of nuclear weapons at any of these sites, but as a metallurgical engineer, he did help sustain a source of power that has become increasingly divisive, even when it's not being weaponized. Nuclear reactors create so much energy and so much radioactive waste. They make our lives much easier and more precarious. About a year after the Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011, a prospective student told me in no uncertain terms that she would not be attending Cal Poly's graduate program in English due to the location of the Diablo Canyon reactor about 20 minutes away by car. Many felt as she did, and countries around the world began shuttering their reactors in the years to follow. And then Russia invaded Ukraine, putting tens of thousands of people at risk, not only from explosive fireball-generating weaponry, but from disruption in grain distribution and the flow of oil and natural gas. Suddenly, countries like ours began rethinking the closing of nuclear plants, holding on to the very technology that has birthed the nuclear weapons Russia keeps threatening to use. What is the world coming to? Well, its end, at some point, whatever you believe about the ultimate nature of reality. Will humans hasten its destruction? We can only hope and pray that we don't, and do what we can to present warmongers with an alternative. Instead of feeding our obsession with destructive beauty, like that presented by the mushroom cloud of a nuclear detonation, admittedly gorgeous, perhaps we can join Lewis Carroll's Alice in looking at actual mushrooms up close, reveling in a beautiful, delicate architecture that reveals itself without the assistance of either scalpel or flame. I'll close by noting that halfway through Nolan's film, Oppenheimer finds himself quoting a poem by John Donne, lines which apparently inspire the name he gives to the United States' first nuclear detonation, Trinity. Nolan only includes the first line, but I'm going to give you the sonnet in full. It has a special place in my heart because I wrote a college paper about it back at Center College in 1990. Batter my heart, three person to God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, overthrow me, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like a usurped town to another do, labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. Reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captive, and proves weak or untrue. Yet, Dearly, I love you, and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie, or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I, except you enthrall me, 
never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. What do you think? Does the world need to be battered and broken just a bit more before we finally learn to treat nuclear technology with more respect and restraint? Is global reformation, which includes Russia, North Korea, and other nuclear-powered countries like ourselves, impractical, impossible even? Are we destined to burn in nuclear fire one of these days? And if not, if you do see hope in the future, where do you find it?